At 4 a.m. on June 25, 1950, the armies of North Korea stormed across the 38th parallel, hoping to crush the South in one overwhelming offensive. 135,000 communists besieged a ragtag South Korean border patrol and steamrolled southward. At outposts all along the border, South Koreans and their American military advisors were overrun, caught completely off guard. The U.S. had deprived South Korea of weapons and ammunition, thinking it might invade the North and start a war. Syngman Rhee, the South's fiery and aggressive leader, had threatened to do so. All that held him back was a lack of firepower. Now, the U.S. strategy of restraint had backfired. The South was on the receiving end, with nothing to defend itself against the communist tanks and heavy artillery. In just two days, Seoul, the South Korean capital lying 30 miles below the parallel, was captured by the North. Terrified South Koreans rushed to escape the city. Roads leading south over the Han River were jammed with refugees and truckloads of equipment. But in fear of the communist advance, southern officials ordered the bridges destroyed. When they exploded, hundreds of refugees were still struggling to cross. Nearly all of them perished. Thousands more were cut off from escape. News of Seoul's collapse spread quickly through the countryside. Overnight, panic permeated the southern peninsula. North Korea hoped the U.S. would look the other way and let the South be taken. But the American home front was being whipped into a frenzy over communist aggression. If South Korea fell to the Reds, would Japan be next? Sensing public outrage, President Harry Truman immediately called for U.S. air and sea strikes against North Korean targets. Korea is a small country, thousands of miles away. But at what is happening there is important to every American. An act of aggression such as this creates a very real danger to the security of all free nations. This is a direct challenge to the efforts of free nations to build the kind of world in which men can live in freedom and peace. This challenge has been presented squarely. We must meet it squarely. American jets went right to work, shooting down six North Korean fighter planes on their first day in action. The Navy bombarded the enemy coastline from the sea. But the communists owned the land, and they pushed on virtually unfazed. There was speculation that the U.S. would use the atom bomb as it had on Japan, but Russia had deployed one successfully the previous summer, presenting a dangerous new threat. Dropping the bomb now would risk Armageddon, so it was clear to U.S. commanders that this war would have to be fought from the trenches. Truman called on the United Nations to lead a police action against North Korea. The prompt action of the United Nations to put down lawless aggression and the prompt response to this action by free peoples all over the world will stand as a landmark in mankind's long search for a rule of law among nations. United States forces would be the backbone of the operation. But the force of the U.S. military in 1950 was dangerously weak. Its budget was one-tenth what it had been in 1945, and combat troops in the Far East were few and far between. What strength was left was thousands of miles away, bolstering NATO forces against the Warsaw Pact nations in Eastern Europe. Douglas MacArthur, the commander-in-chief of Far East forces and a legendary World War II general, would face a great challenge as leader of operations. A supremely confident man with a larger-than-life presence, MacArthur was the face of America to the Asian world. His cherished military legacy would be put to the test in Korea. 
The first brigade to reach the front was Task Force Smith. Its reports confirmed the dangers that lay ahead. In early July, the brigade ran into a column of North Koreans 30 miles below Seoul. Waiting in a cluster of hills, the force hid motionless until the enemy was upon them and then let loose with everything they had. But the northern tanks were undeterred. Task Force Smith only knocked out four and the other 33 rolled right through its lines. For the first of many times in the war, the Americans were trapped behind the enemy and had to fight their way out. Guys fell around me as mortar rounds zeroed in on us. One of my young guys got it in the middle. Oh Jesus, the guy was moaning and groaning. There wasn't much I could do but pat him on the head and say, hang in there. Lieutenant Philip Day Jr., Task Force Smith. It quickly became clear that this was no police action. This was war. And unless support arrived in a hurry, it would be a short one. Troops from the U.S. 8th Army arrived from Japan over the next few weeks, but they were trying to stop a flood with their hands. The North Koreans were pushing steadily south toward Pusan, and U.N. troops faced a real possibility of being driven into the sea. The first American strategy was to dig in along the front and set up blockades. But time and again, the North Koreans would move around them and block from the rear unit after unit was trapped in enemy territory. By July 20th, only a small corner of South Korea was left to conquer. The United Nations was losing the race against time.